All right. Aloha mai kako. My name is Brianna Govea. I'm the Collections and Program Specialist at the King Kamehameha V Judiciary History Center. On behalf of the center, mahalo for joining us. Uh, we haven't had a program for a while this year, so if you're new to us, it, um, welcome. And if you're a returning program attendee, it's great to be with you. While the remarks shared today don't necessarily represent opinions of the judiciary, I'd like to thank Chief Justice Mark Rechtenwald and the Hawaii State Judiciary and Legislature for their continued support of our mission and for providing a venue for this discussion. It is my great pleasure uh, to introduce our guest speaker tonight, Cindy Punihaole from West Hawaii Island. As director of the Kahalu Bay Education, Education Center, excuse me, Cindy is doing her part to create a new legacy of keepers of the bay that will care for land and sea as she and her kupuna have for centuries. Mm -hmm. um, and before I turn it over to her to share more about herself and Kahalu Bay, I have a little bit of housekeeping to do. Um, I do want to let you all know that we will have time at the end for question and answers. So please use the Q&A box at the bottom of your webinar screen. You should see a little icon saying Q&A and we'll take those questions at the end. This program is also being recorded and it will be up on the Judiciary History Center's YouTube channel by the end of the week. All right, without further ado, I have a little video to play for us all, and then we'll start our discussion with Cindy. Lots of drastic change in those before and after um, photos. So Cindy, would you mind yes. um, just telling us a little bit about your family's history on uh, West Hawaii and the importance mm -hmm. of taking care of Wahipana like Kahalu Bay? Yes, and, and thank Mahalo Brianna and welcome everyone. I appreciate your time uh, with us uh, this evening. Um, my family is from uh, North Kona on Hawaii Island and um, a family from Kahalu, uh, Makalawina, Kukio, um, all the way up through uh, Kohala, uh, Kiholo. So growing up in, in, uh, in Kona back in the 1950s and 1960s, it was a very uh, difficult life because we did not have any running uh, 
water inside facilities. It was what we uh, call really a country. But at the same time, it was so wonderful uh, an experience to be able to um, live off the land and learn those, those important unwritten social codes that our, our families, our tutus and my dad taught us uh, these pono practices, only take what you need, make sure that you, you take care of place. And so growing up all of my life as a fisherman, um, I always were my own enforcer. I, when I threw my net, I would always know how much to take, what to throw back, because my, my dad taught me. So those, those codes were part of my life. And that's things that I would like to share with our children. So they become their own enforcers rather than have a do-care officer in the back of them asking to look at their cooler, how much did they take or not take? And, and being an educator, I think it's important that we, uh, we teach our children these, uh, these Pono practices. But looking back in, during my life, the areas that I just spoke about were bountiful and the corals were pristine. That's why when I, when I view that video that you just shared, it breaks my heart because I see what it was like and I remember and what, and I also see what it is today. And we have an opportunity and um, a means to help remove the stressors that are affecting our bay, like pollution, like um, carrying capacity, looking at uh, um, how we can continue the healing of our, our uh, aina for future generations. So uh, I, I visualize a child a hundred years from now saying, Mahalo kupuna, whoever you were, whoever you were for thinking of us. I, I think for me, that is why I do what I do today. Thank you, Cindy, that's beautiful. Would you um, mind breaking down for us a little bit more um, about the local stress stressors that Kahulu Bay is facing that we saw in that video? And and maybe follow that up with how the time during um, the COVID pandemic, how that was able to impact the Bay as well. Mm -hmm. Yes, okay. So uh, Kahalu Bay is, is one of the most beautiful bays, I, I believe, on the Kona Coast. But the stressors that, that are um, inundating the Bay right now are Cesspool, uh, uh, cesspools that are along Ali Drive, right along the bay, um, um, uh, pollution runoff from, from the streets. We have sunscreen pollution. Um, and, and of course, we're looking at climate change that comes in. It's a stressor for our uh, corals in. in 2015, uh, we found bleaching, uh, major bleaching occurring at Kahalu, uh, and then again in 2019. So, our right now we at Kahalu Bay, 95 percent of our cauliflower corals are dead, and. For the last uh, four years, we have been working with the county to look at closure, cauliflower uh, spawning closure days. So during those uh, time periods, 
the county and Kahalubi Education Center um, close will uh, will close the bay. And this year, the spawning cycle will be May 16 um, to May 21st, and we will close the park during that time. So we do need to look at providing our uh, our cauliflower gametes, which are the the um, when you're looking at a coral spawning, you you want to give them time to find um, a place where the planula can find a place to settle. So providing that space for them, that days of rest will give them that opportunity to not only settle, uh, but also prepare to grow. And today, because we did that last year in May, we, and the year before, we find a lot of juvenile corals coming up in the Bay. And you talk about uh, the COVID uh, uh, pause that we, we experienced back in 2020. That was such an eye opener for us because March, 2020, the park was closed. And within a couple of months, we saw a rejuvenation of the Bay. Uh, not only looking at new species coming back into the bay, but we also saw algae, limu, abundance growing on the papa, on the tidal flats, turtles coming in to graze. We saw the migratory birds coming back. And that is, I believe, Mother Nature sharing with us. And, and because she cannot speak speak to us, she's showing us that if you give me some time, I will show you how I can heal. And so within the, uh, the COVID pause of 2020, we continue to see that healing. And moving into this, this uh, year, but also we see uh, an opening of, uh, of tourism in Hawaii that is also causing a disruption of that healing. So I think what we need to do is find that balance to welcome a, a visitor, but also to be mindful to take care of place. Can you um, share a little bit more about how working with uh, the county and uh, local businesses was to get the bay closure kind of approved and uh, okayed in the community? Yes, so I, it's a collaboration of state, county uh, uh, businesses, the Chamber of Commerce uh, uh, and, and residents. You, yeah, I think it's important that all of those bases are touched and, and covered as you're looking at the reason why you are uh, closing a, a, certain, um, a certain part like Kahalu. Education, I think, is the key and knowledge is the key. So talking with the, the county first and the state, uh, uh, DAR, uh, Department of Aquatics Resources, um, explaining uh, why it was important. And they were also part of my team, our team saying, we understand it and we need to do this. Now, when we close the park, our volunteers, our Reef Teach volunteers were also at the park every day, educating visitors or residents who happened to stop by on, on why it was important to close the, the park. And so it was not just about closing a place, but it was 
about educating the uh, community and, and businesses and visitors why it was so important to do this. For me, I think successes happen if we have collaboration. You cannot just do it in a vacuum or in a silo. Did Thank I answer you. your question? Yes, yes, most definitely. And we did have a question come in um, q and I just want to address really yeah, quickly. Well, sure. What are the landmarks that delineate Kahalu'u Bay so we can situate ourselves oh, a little better? Oh, mm, landmarks, okay. Um, do you, where the, um, Kiaho Kona Beach Hotel used to stand on along a lead drive it was a south side of oh uh, can I show you a map? Um, hmm. I can try to look. Um, Maybe we can look, look for a map. I don't have it right at hand, but if you're if you're driving along a lead drive from Kailua Kona town, you will um, you will pass a landmark called Magic Sands, and the very next bay is Kahalu Bay. So the north side of it of the bay landmark would be Saint Peter's Church. And the south side would be the Keo Beach Hotel, which uh, Kamehameha Schools had, had uh, uh, removed, but it is now going to be a, a cultural um, area mm -hmm. for, can you, uh, okay. Can so, you see the map I just pulled up? Yep, okay. So yeah. where it says Kahalu Keho. Oops. Uh, let's see. There we go. Yeah, there you go. Right there. So, <laughs> so here's a lead drive. And you see, Brianna, the Keoho Beach Hotel is still there on your yeah. map. This white, mm -hmm. uh, this white structure to the south, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. That's and then on the north, on the north side, it says the uh, Kona Sea Spray. Mm -hmm. That area there is Kahalu Bay and Kahalu mm -hmm. Beach Park. Does that answer your question? I mean, oh. Yeah, perfect. Good to get us oriented. Okay. Um, Thank you for asking that question. <laughs> so, yeah, definitely the. Um, it's interesting to hear about this because when I first learned about the um, closures for the coral spawning, I didn't. I wasn't privy to what different um, organizations and levels really had to coordinate um, mm -hmm. coordinate this, and mm -hmm. it makes me think about the other uh, carrying capacities at other bays across the islands yes, and yeah. what you've learned um, yeah. from looking at those examples. And uh, if you can just share more about that. Well, we were the first bay in that uh, we quested a closure for uh, cauliflower coral spawn spawning. And then last year, the state parks, Wailea Bay up in Puaco, that's on the north, side of uh, the northern part of the island, they also closed their uh, park while they are uh, beach uh, for coral spawning because they felt that it was important. So when corals spawn, they don't just spawn at Kahalu Bay, they're spawning. And because of the amount of, uh, of uh, coral uh, death we have along the coast, it was very important that other bays look at this kind of uh, closure cycle 
so that other bays have an opportunity for their gametes and planula to actually settle and grow. Now, I know that a week is not enough because uh, sometimes it takes up to 90 days for a, for a planula to find a, a good spot to settle. But I feel that it's, we're lucky that we have partnerships like the county who would provide some time for the majority of these uh, planula to be able to settle. So we really are blessed that working with, for me, working with our county officials have been uh, very uh, prosperous and, and our businesses too, the Chamber of Commerce, the, the, the uh, community. And, you know, we really have a beautiful community in Kona. And I think that really makes a difference too. We really care about each other and we really care about the Aina. Um, another relevant question, so I, I want to address it now. Um, what okay. was the reaction of visitors to the park closure and how supportive was um, HTA and the visitor industry to the closure? Oh, you know, it's, it's interesting because we had so many visitors uh, coming to the, uh, to the bay. And, uh, first of all, we did a press release letting, um, letting uh, uh, to, to the TV stations and media and uh, HTA, Hawaii Island Visitors Bureau, uh, uh, letting them know that we're closing. But visitors, I think it's almost like a paradigm shift. Uh, in, in the beginning, when we closed, we started with a half a day. The county said, okay, you can close a half a day. And people are saying, oh, but I wanna go into the bay. But I think over the years, because we talk about these um, events, our education, a reef, our education programs and our reef teachers are at Kahalube every day. So we we're constantly talking about uh, reef etiquette and we citizen science programs that we do and um, uh, sunscreen, looking at sunscreen, uh, zinc oxide uh, versus chemicals, and we promote zinc oxide to take care of the reef. So it's, it's um, education. The more education uh, we put out about uh, the closures and why we're doing it, the key is to let people know why you're doing it. So last year we were closed for a whole week. Our volunteers were at the park entrance every day, educating and, and visitors would come in and say, I understand. I mean, they were so receptive and appreciative too that we were, uh, we were closing it because of this reason. And, and of course, you know, around the world, we see bleaching events and we see what corals, what's happening to the Great Barrier Reef, all of these things. So when they saw what we were doing, they were very, very uh, respectful. And it wasn't as though they couldn't go to another bay. They could go to another bay. We were the bay that was closed for that day, uh, for that week. But we, the amount of um, positive feedback was overwhelming. It and um, and again, we were blessed for that. Yeah. How well, you mentioned um, sunscreen and its impact on mm -hmm. coral reefs as well. So I'm curious, how um, how has the bill that passed? I think it was a year or two um, ago now. Has that, um, have you seen significant changes from that um, and the education well, opportunity to teach people about that? Well, the, the bill you're talking about is Act 104, which uh, Governor Ige signed uh, back in 2018, but mm -hmm. went into law uh, 
January of last year, 2021. And, but prior to that, I noticed that on the shelves, the sunscreen companies were already uh, changing their formulas. So you wouldn't see uh, any oxybenzone, oxynoxate um, in the ingredients. It became avobenzone, octocrylene, homosalate, etc. But we also know, based on uh, scientific uh, papers, that these are also concern uh, chemicals. But for oxybenzone, oxynoxate, uh, because it's banned in Hawaii, very few uh, stores, if any, I think only a couple carry, uh, had carried that last year. But it's, it's, it for, it's a Hawaii law. It's not um, um, a law on the mainland. So what we see or uh, people bringing their products to the islands with those chemicals in them. And, and we have a program at Kahalu Bay, which is a swap. So visitors can swap their chemical sunscreens for, um, for um, zinc, ox, uh, zinc oxide or titanium dioxide. Because we feel that, and the FDA has approved those two ingredients as safe, generally safe uh, um, and effective uh, drugs for sunscreen. So for us, we're looking at what is, um, we look at the FDA uh, categories, uh, a category one, which is generally recognized as safe and effective, which is zinc oxide and titanium dioxide. Category two is uh, uh, non-grace, or uh, unsubstantiated, which are, which are the other, uh, other um, chemical ingredients. So we apply the precautionary principle until it can be proven safe and effective. Let us hold off and use what uh, the FDA has, has uh, proved to be safe and effective. I think it's important because we have hundreds and hundreds of scientific papers that uh, share the concern of chemical sunscreens. And if that, until we can prove it, we should uh, hold off on allowing those sunscreens to be part of our uh, commercial uh, retail products. Mm -hmm. And because people are still bringing um, some of these products with them, it's still a harm in the Bay. It's so still a harm. Yeah. And, and because they're not uh, regulated, um, uh, because they're not regulated on the mainland, oxybenz and oxynoxate. So we, what I've done at Kahalu is um, um, put in two mineral sunscreen dispensers. So if people come to the bay and they uh, they bring their chemical sunscreens. We ask them to use our dispensers, and now Waialea Bay has a sunscreen dispenser. It's a state park, but they decided that this was the better way to go, and so they installed their uh, dispenser last year, and. Maui just installed their um, sunscreen dispensers last month. So for, um, for Ahihi and, um, and I think, I'm, I'm, I'm glad that that is happening because I think we should really try to take care of our, um, our base, our coral reefs, because they don't have a voice. We are their voice. And looking at um, the, the ingredients that uh, have been proven to be safe, I think is what we should be doing. And educating our, our visitors is very important. 
And that's that's fantastic. You guys provide the mineral sunscreen option on at the bay. That's great. Um, it, mm -hmm. It's um, it's it's very expensive. It's not it's it, it's not free, but uh, Target was my first sponsor, and they purchase all my product. And now mm -hmm. my second sponsor is Three Sixty Five Hawaii which is a, a grassroots organization of community members. So we find that our community now is embracing the Bay because the Bay not only gives us life, it gives our businesses life. Kahlu Bay is like the heart of Kailua Kona and restaurants, um, hotels, uh, all these businesses are uh, their survival is, and their econo uh, the economic driver for, uh, for our area is Kahalu Bay because it's so beautiful and people want to come and experience it. Uh, and following up with that, it makes me think um, back to your hope of having a more formalized rotating closure of the bay so people mm -hmm. can... Um, visit the bays at different times during the spawning season. And how are there plans? Um, are, you, are you advocating for something more formalized to go through the legislature for this? Or what would that um, process look like to you? And we have a question that came in asking, what will it take to get the Hawaii Hotel Association to support reef protection throughout the state? Well, I think, I think when you're and I'm working on uh, rotating closure days because I, I, I truly believe that working with HTA, Hawaii Island Visitors Bureau, the county and the state uh, is, is very important, especially if, in, in uh, coral reef bays where you need to give the bay time to rest and recover. So if we're looking at a rotation closure, rotating closure days, let's say Kahalu may close on a Monday, where Ho'okena may close on a Tuesday, Ho'nau now on a, a Wednesday. But those, those times are being uh, shared on websites like HDA and a Hawaii Island visitor. So the, uh, so the visitor will pre can prepare themselves before they come to Hawaii Island and uh, know what bays are closed and, and where, what they should be doing on those days. But there, there are other bays that are open that are sandy, like Anaiho Malu up, up north, there are bays that are sandy or uh, Magic Sands. But I think for our, our coral bays, we need to look at, uh, coral reef bays, we need to look at um, providing them time to, uh, to heal and, and looking at carrying capacity too. Um, looking at programs that can help support the bay. Kahalu Bay is a very shallow, beautiful, uh, welcoming bay, but it's easy to step all over the bay. So we need to, I think, look at projects can, that can help provide a rewarding experience for the visitor, but at the same time, uh, make sure that we are not trampling all over the bay. So I, I look at a snorkel, uh, a voluntary snorkel trail where our visitors can have a rewarding experience, but they are not uh, snorkeling and, and stepping all over the baby corals in other areas of the bay. Have you had any um, hotels reach, reach out to you to get your education support and um, um, work to improve their shorelines, their we, beach fronts? We, um, prior to uh, COVID, we were working with uh, the Sheraton, but now it's the Outrigger, right? So, and 
and we've worked with the uh, uh, Royal Kona Resort. So this is a time that as we start into the um, into welcoming more visitors, it is a time that we will go out again and talk with those um, uh, um, hotels. And for, for me, I think what we need to do is create a partnership with our hotels because it's not about um, stopping them from uh, from bringing customers to them, but educating them. So when they are out in the, um, in not only at Kahalu, but any other location, any other bay, they can be responsible uh, visitors. Because I believe if we educate and engage our visitors with aloha, they will, you because you want them to be part of the solution. So education, creating that kind of space for them in a, in a loving way, they can help you take care of a place rather than not educating them and they, and you think that they're a problem. It's, I have talked to hundreds and hundreds of visitors over the years. We've been at Kalu since 2006. And all of, once a visitor, 99.9% .9 of the visitors, once they are educated, they will try their very best to be respectful. So it is about, I believe, education and respect. Well, what you're doing at Kahulu Bay to me is a prime example of what we should be doing elsewhere. But I'm curious if there are uh, models that you look to to follow or organizations you're trying to leverage to um, add more security to Kah Kahulu Bay. So if you could speak about that. Yes. Well, I, I think I look at Hanauma Bay um, because my friend is actually Lisa Bishop <laughs> and she is the president of the Friends of Hanauma Bay. But we work really close together as we look at different, um, um, implementing different, different projects. Uh, you know, they're working with carrying capacity and uh, at Pupukea, who, uh, uh, you know, working with uh, Denise, it, I think I think discussions with other uh, bays are important because they they are similar to Kahalu, but then there are other uh, fact facts that you have to bring into play that may be different, but. I think foundations can be built. And, and that's why I look to these uh, other bays and their, um, their champions to help support and actually look at developing uh, programs that we can then create as models and share out to other bays. One of the things that Kahalu, because we're small, we're able to create models and able to monitor that monitor quickly and um, and then create standard operating practices behind them and then share it off to another bay. It's I think it's important for small bays to be able to do that for each other so uh, that all those little bays can prosper. And, and working really closely with the county, with Frisia, at our, um, with county R&D, I think it's important that that kind of information and resources get out to the community. Who's doing what? Why is it important? Um, and, and, and how actually, how did you create the model? So it's important for 
for the model to have that standard operating procedure in place too. And, and um, I believe that we, we work together very well. Hanama uh, is, is one of the bays that I look at in, as I create uh, programs at Kahalu. Can you talk about uh, the support of organizations like Mission Blue in helping to bring uh, attention and support and security to phase? Mm -hmm. Well, well, you know, Mission Blue, oh, and we've been talking to uh, Mission Blue uh, as as uh, looking at Mission Blue as uh, as an, a nonprofit founded by Sylvia Earle uh, to actually look at different areas around the world as hope spots, you know, which are ecologically unique areas of the ocean and designated for protection under a global conservation campaign. That's what Mission Blue does, right? So um, I think for, for Kahalu being a little, um, a smaller bay can provide that kind of hope and aspiration for small bays around the world to be able to uh, understand that they can make a difference. They don't have to be a, a, a huge Cayman Islands or, or uh, you know, looking at uh, the Sargasso Sea as, as these huge areas that may find impossible to, to be able to um, uh, manage. But in a small bay like Kahalu, we share things that we have implemented, we can implement immediately and share with another small bay because funding is very critical when, when we are looking at implementing projects. But for a small bay, $50,000 is a lot of money, but $40 isn't. So if we can create a program or a project that costs $40 and yet still be able to create a win-win situation, then sharing that kind of a project to us with a small bay can be very um, beneficial. And, and I've seen that happen. So I, my hope is that Kahalu can become a model and create programs that can be shared to small bays around the world. Yeah. Confident that you'll be able to do that. It's very exciting. Um, so yes. we're we're we've got our last fifteen minutes, and we have some questions coming in. And I know we have a final video that we want to share. So yeah. let me um, ask you some of the questions that have come in. Michael says your management strategies are perfectly aligned with destination tourism, and I also think about sustainable tourism, getting the visitors to be part of the solution rather than. The problem and he asks how has hta embraced and supported these strategies um if if you're in your opinion i think uh, you know hta i i i'm very hopeful uh because john de is is uh heading hda now and he has those same visions of taking care of place uh, uh looking at uh, at, at traditional knowledge is as important as educating our visitors about 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 our vahipana. These are very sacred storied places that prior to um, to John uh, taking over as the head of HDA was not even part of a discussion. 
though I shouldn't say it wasn't, it, it was part of a discussion, but the drive for HDA was more of a tourist. Let's see how many tourists can we, uh, can we bring in? But now there's a shift of creating uh, a space for a cultural, um, traditional knowledge that we can share with the visitor and the visitor can become part of that understanding. For example, at, at Kahalu, we talk about kilo, you know, observations and sharing it with the visitor. Observations were critical for us, for me growing up, uh, understanding the ocean, observing the, the Mauka, the mountains. But I truly believe if we continue the development of what HDA has started, we will be in a better place where our visitor will become, again, part of the solution because they understand what a vahipana is and how, how, they're, uh, how to be respectful when they enter a certain places. Thank you. On that note, uh, Hokulea has asked, are there any publications that discuss the creation and effects of the programs implemented at Kahalu Bay? Are there any publications? No, I, I, it's formal studies or magazine articles, newspaper articles. <laughs> <laughs> well, we just, what I, when, what I did at, uh, so we've been, uh, I'll share this. We, we've been doing uh, citizen science uh, for, since 2009, uh, uh, taking water quality samples. So now we have a hui, uh, Hawaii Viola, where our data, is being collected and the Department of Health has approved our, um, a, our what they call a quality um, uh, QAPP, which is uh, exact uh, taking, taking data in a, in a very stringent way. You, and so, because they approved the way we're taking our data, they will now take that and apply it to their website. So all of our data will go up into their website. But at the same time, what we're doing is um, creating, because our, we've implemented programs back uh, just a couple of years uh, to, to help take care of our place. These are not, haven't been published, but we have them in place where we can share with other bays. So those, you know, those are things that are for me very critical. Um, but if a bay is ready to um, take on that kind of, uh, um, program, then we're willing to share. A lot of our, our people from uh, the Hilo side come to me and say, Cindy, can you help me develop a reef teach program, a reef etiquette program at my bay? And for me is, I, I grew up in a place where we never went into someone else's place. We were invited in. If a community came to me and said, uh, can you please help me create a reef teach program at, at my bay, then I will do that. And Puako community came to me and asked me to do that. And we did that in 2014. And, but 
if a, if someone just from another area came and said, can you come without talking to their community, I would hesitate because, because I grew up that way. You never went into someone else's area and say, I can do this for you. You want them to want you to be there. So um, I hope I answered you. <laughs> I hope. <laughs> um, we have a few more questions coming in and then I want, I really want to play the trailer. So Ruth asks if, um, we see sometimes at hotels and in airports, mm -hmm. uh, instructional videos or promotional videos about different organizations in the area you can visit. And Ruth was curious if, uh, if the if your video that we played at the beginning, the Kahulu Bay then and now, if that is going to be shown um, at hotels or resorts as sort of an educational uh, material for yeah. visitors. Yeah, that that uh, uh, educational visit uh, uh, that video needs to be uh, prefaced so people understand what it means, where it is, but. I have a video on Hawaiian Airlines on reef etiquette. The problem that I've experienced with airlines, and I really need help here, is I need to have a one minute video or even a 30 second video on a channel where people are going to view it. Like a channel where you can, um, you can watch your your plane. Uh, um, how many how many hours are you away from um, Hawaii Island? You know, from LA or vice versa. Where just one minute or thirty seconds of that channel will share education on sunscreen, reef etiquette, things of that nature. But the video that I have on uh, Hawaiian Airlines is seven minutes. And it's a great reef etiquette video of Kahalu'u, but it's in their drive that has what, 15,000 videos? So who's going to watch it? It's difficult. We, you need to have these PSAs front and center. I had it front and center on Aloha Airlines where just before the movie, our video showed. So everyone was focused on that a monitor. But it's very difficult for me to get it on Alaskan Airlines or United. I've, I've had uh, vice presidents say to me, it's, it, it's a lot of money. One minute is a lot of money to play a video. And I'm, I'm think, I was thinking, if you just played the video and, and people were watching it, and they, when they came to Hawaii, they were respectful, you would always have a beautiful coral reef 100 years from now, and you'd still have people on your flight coming here. It, it really, it, it doesn't make sense. It, for, for me, I believe that if we could have on all incoming flights, a minute of time where people can, can actually view these videos, I think it'll make a big difference. But I need well, help to find the person that I, I need to talk to. <laughs> and this is a beautiful segue to introduce the documentary that's in development right now featuring you and Kahulu Bay. So before we wrap up, I would like to uh, share that with our audience. Okay. All right. Kahulu is a sacred story cultural area. It's really a coral reef. We know that corals are the rainforest of the ocean. Without it, we would not be here. I want to know why our corals are dying. 
People think the Hawaiian Islands are doing just fine. Those of us who measure and monitor know that's far, far, far from true. Corals are turning bright white because of the thermal stress. We have so many cesspools leaching into our bays. Put it bluntly, I believe we're almost at critical mass at, at the bay. We can't leave this to our children. Shame on us if we do that. Cindy's relationship with the bay and her care for the bay is not unlike how she would relate to her own grandmother. It is that familial. I had a plan in place in 2007. I needed to show the county that we were there to help restore the park and be able to manage it and create a very, very strong educational program. Cindy has an excellent program here where they're hoping that corals can start to replenish naturally. This is our prototype beach. It can be proven here. We can show the world that it can happen. Because it's not just Hawaii where, where we're losing our reefs and losing our coral, it's worldwide. We want our children to say, mahalo kupuna, whoever you were, for thinking of me. They don't have to know my name, our names. They just need to look at Kahalu and see that it is still there. Wow, okay, so yeah. that needs to be the feature film on all the airlines this summer. <laughs> Thank you so much, Auntie was, Cindy, for your work, you. your life's work, for your family's work. Um, I, I just, I am so honored to have been able to share space with you to, with you tonight and have this dialogue with our audience. And I know Thank there you. there were several wow. more questions we didn't get to go to. I can, um, I can email. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. Fantastic. Um, Mahalo, yeah, everyone. So I'll, I'll make sure to connect Auntie Cindy with whoever. Um, you'll get a audience attendees who are here with us right now. You'll get a follow up email um, okay. via Zoom with my email in that. So feel free to respond with questions, and I'll connect you um, with Cindy. And in the chat, I also shared direct links to the Kohala Center, more information about this trailer, the documentary um, trailer we just watched, uh, as well as our post event survey, which we would uh, really appreciate for you to be able um, to fill out. And before we go, I did also just wanna share that the Judiciary History Center is finally open um, to okay. scheduled tours. Tuesdays, Wednesdays, and Thursdays. Uh, you do have to book online ahead of time. I shared the link in the chat as well, um, jhchawaii.net, and you'll go to visit guided tours to book your tours if you want to come see us. Um, Cindy, do you have any uh, anything you would like to close with? I just want to share, and uh, Brianna, thank you so much for allowing me to be here tonight and share our work at Kahalu and for all of our participants and, and your wonderful questions. And if I didn't answer your questions, uh, please share uh, with me on email. I'll be glad to talk story with you. It is my It was my pleasure to be here. And all again, right. mahalo, mahalo everyone. And we'll be in touch, Auntie Cindy. Thank you okay, so aloha. much.